Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We're going to be starting in um, two or three weeks teaching on the authority of the believer. But before we get to that, I wanted to, to kind of lay a foundation for our authority and teach on blood covenant. Now, this is going to be an overview. It's not going to be an in-depth blood covenant study. So we're going to take a couple of weeks and we'll go, we'll go over some things and um, share along the lines of blood covenant. And um, hallelujah. Glory to God. Y'all got to just go late today. I got to get some things out. Hallelujah. Let's, uh, let's, let's just jump right in here. To, uh, ministering on, the, on the, the covenant of blood, the blood covenant that we have as believers. One of the things that we use when we're studying blood covenant is a lot of times we'll study uh, the book by H. Clay Trumbull. It's no book. I don't even know if it's in print anymore. Uh, called The Blood Covenant. It is an academic book. It is not a bedside reading book. It just isn't. It's, a, it's just a very, um, it was written from a theologian, from a, an academian standpoint. Very, very, it's like somebody could have done their dissertation with this thing. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, a, a 32 page mini book or, you know, a little, you know, how to have faith in your faith, boom, you're done. It, it takes time. So we're going to dissect it for you real quick. All right? The book covers. Uh, uh, Brother Clum, uh, Trumbull took the travels of Stanley and Livingston across to Africa and did a study of that and found out that they, they cut the covenant. Stanley cut the covenant 50 times traveling across Africa. Now, you understand, white British going across Africa and the time that they went, uh, they usually got killed. There, there's something, it was, it was, some of these tribes never seen anything, never seen a white man before, and here they come walking in with uh, all this stuff, and they, they just thought, you know, you, you're the devil, and they kill them. And so one, one of the ways that Stanley Livingston found to um, get around getting killed was cut covenants. And by cutting the covenant, they began to get the protection or the goods or the supplies and different things they needed from different tribes by coming into covenant with them. And so we, we have historically blood covenants have been used in all primitive people. And listen, the reason we do this is because the primitiveness of this is a degrading of what God originally did when he cut the covenant with Adam and then again with Abraham. You know, uh, we, we see elements of this and how strong it is, even watered down through centuries, we still see the strength of it tells us how strong it is with God. That's why we make reference to this. Um, Stanley cut the covenant over 50 times. Uh, Livingston says that it was a common practice in Africa and it was a very sacred rite. It wasn't just something they did lightly. Um, and he, he said in his writing, he never knew the covenant to be broken. Okay? Um, to break the covenant there in their travels meant death. If somebody would break the covenant, their own family would kill them. So if uh, Ben and Nathan cut a covenant and Ben goes out and breaks it, Bill would kill him. That's how, str I know we're not going to do that. Okay? We're not going to, you know, I'm just saying. For example, Bill would kill him. All right? Because it was so strong, it violated something so sacred that it, 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 was, it was like a curse would come on the family if something wasn't done to rectify the fact that somebody broke the covenant. Okay? Um, that the covenant carried on even to the third and fourth generations. It was uh, perpetual and dissolvable and could not be annulled. In other words, you couldn't go to court and, and have it annulled. And you could break it, and if you broke it, the curses came on you. All right? And uh, blood brothers were considered more close than... Um, Regular natural born brothers. Cut, how, how they did it? They would cut their wrist, cut their fingers, cut their palms, and um, either they would rub them together, or they would drip it into to a glass of wine and drink it. But you know, uh, and, and this is where our handshake comes from. This this right here came out of cutting a blood covenant. Okay, it, it, it's not just something we came up with. It had to do with cutting a blood covenant because they would either, or, or they would kind of you know do something like this. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. All, right. All, right. all right, right on. All right, that, that sh the handshake came from blood covenant. That's, where, that's why, you know, your parents, my, well, actually my parents' generation and their parents, if they shook on it, you didn't have to sign an agreement. You didn't, you didn't go to a lawyer. 
When you shook on it, that was it. And some people say, well, why are you doing that? We shook on it. Yeah, but there's, that's not, not, I shook on it. And it's so strong because that came out of blood covenant. Even though they weren't cutting the blood, that's, that, that whole idea upon shaking on it meant that I could not go back on my word. I could not refuse to do what I said I would do. We shook on it. You, you heard old people say, we shook on it. That's all they needed to do. That was it. Why? Because the effect or the mindset of covenant was in that handshake. Okay? All right. That's why, that's why shaking his hand meant, meant something. That mean, listen, we live in a generation that nothing means anything. We've got the most dishonorable. Get up. I do. Thank you, Melanie. Did you get more my water? <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So, even sometimes they would take, like, gunpowder or something and rub into the wound so that when it healed up, it left a scar. I'm in covenant. Okay? Um, there was a pronouncement of blessings and cursings. When they got ready, they get out there and get ready to cut the covenant. Uh, and back, you know, you had the witch doctor. So the, 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 doc, the witch doctor would come out of the priest of the village or whatever they, they use in their spiritual thing would come out and pronounce all these blessings. You know, if we, when we come into covenant together, my, my house is yours. My land is yours. My food is yours. In all honesty, it was even so strong, my wife and my children were yours. Now see, the other side of the covenant, walking in honor, wouldn't take advantage of that. Like taking the wife. I mean, but that's how strong it was. If he wanted the wife, he had to give it to him. And that's how, now listen, you've got to show this is degraded. But I'm trying to show you the strength and how strong blood covenant was. And then, as you got done saying all the blessings, they start saying, now, if you break the covenant, you, I mean, the fleas of a thousand camels are going to infest your armpits. I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> Y'all remember that one? So, yeah, may the fleas of a thousand camels infest your armpits. You know, I mean, you know, you would pronounce all the most God-awful curses on them if you broke the covenant. Well, don't we have that? In Deuteronomy? I'll bless you coming in, bless you going out, but if you do not hearken and do not obey, then all these curses will come on you. You see? Hallelujah. They would exchange gifts, names, articles of clothing, weapons, etc., um, they would share a covenant meal. They would sit down and have a meal, okay? And they may walk off and never see each other for 20 years. But if that guy shows up, they're in covenant, okay? And they would either plant a memorial tree or stones or something, all right? Why would they make covenant? Well, protection and preservation, uh, mutual need, you know, business strength, uh, love and devotion. David and Jonathan had a love covenant. Um, you shared all your assets, strength, abilities, wealth with one another. Uh, each one gave themselves and all their possessions to meet the need of the other in need. Now, when they were traveling across Africa, one, one of the stories is Stanley got to a village, and they, they bartered. They tried. They, did, they came up with everything they could come up with to get the, guy, the chief to enter into a covenant with them. But he wanted Stanley's goat. Stanley had ulcers, and about the only thing he could drink was goat's milk. And he had the goat so he could get the goat milk. The chief wanted the goat. That's one thing he would take. No matter what they offered him, he wanted the goat. And so after bartering and, and, and doing whatever and trying, to, he finally gave in and gave him the goat. You know what he got? A stick with the feathers on it. That's all he got. Can you imagine? I got to give him my goat milk and my goat to save, soothe my stomach, and I get a stick in return. But here's the thing. As he went on travel more, and, and, and eventually he found out from another tribe that tribes had come out to kill them. And when they saw that staff, they went away because they knew he was in covenant with the strongest tribe in the area. They saw, they saw that, and they knew if they killed them, that tribe would come and wipe out their whole village. See? So how, it's, it's, it's strong. See, we carry a banner. 
because we're in covenant with God. Amen? Hallelujah. So, you know, just, just to kind of get, that was just endless, and really, honestly, if we were teaching this uh, in a longer series, we would take more time on some of these things. This is an overview. I want to show you uh, in, in, in historically, in natural, the, even in the natural world where the covenant has been degraded and, and, and worn down and, and got away from God, it's still strong. And it's strong because it's even stronger with God, and it started out even stronger. Okay? So let's look here. Let's go to uh, Genesis 15. <clears throat> now, the word covenant um, means literally to cut, implying the shedding of blood. Okay? When you in, so now we enter in out the contracts and so forth and that kind of thing, but, and they carry weight, but in the covenant, blood was shed, blood was mingled, they became, it became um, just something you couldn't break. And that, that came from God. Look, in you will, as we said, into Genesis 15. We'll just start in verse 1. We're going to that read down to about verse 18, okay? After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. Now, remember his name at this time is Abram. In a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the steward in mine, my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? Now, he's got, a, he's got a, a faithful servant who's had a son, and because Abraham has no children of his own, their, their custom was that the steward's son would take over his inheritance. But that's not what he wanted. He wanted his son. He wanted, he wanted the posterity of his own, okay? And Abram, and, and, um, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. Thou be able to number them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. God is good. He is the God of multiplication. He is not the God of, of division or trust of attraction. Amen? And he believed the Lord. So here's the thing we have to always understand faith is always involved. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he said unto them, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Remember, he told him back, and said, Get thee out of that land, out of thy father's house, from, me, from thy kindred, go into a place that I will show thee. He said, Lord, God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said, and that's God, said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each peace one against the other but the bird, birds divided he not now he basically cut these animals in half set them so that they were you know i don't know how he set it against something or whatever but created a, an opening between the animals and so blood had to be in between there you know poured out of the animals and so forth and when the fowls came down upon the carcasses abraham drove them away and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep came upon Abram, and lo, a great horror of gray darkness fell upon him. And he said, that is God, unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Now look, God is telling him what's going to happen. In their covenant, this is what's going to happen. Okay? And they shall serve them, and they shall afflict, afflict them 400 years. Also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they shall come forth out with great substance. Hallelujah. Didn't they? And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for in the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Now, one of the things about Stanley Livingston they found out was that sometimes somebody could use a substitute to cut the covenant, but it was just as binding as if they had cut it. So, in other words, Chief goes, I'm tired of getting cut. Jules, you're over there. But he was bound by it. Even though there was a substitute they actually did, he was bound by that substitute. Okay. That's, that's important because we have so much substitutionary work in the, in the Bible. A smoke, uh, 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 it was dark, a small smoky furnace, and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, Abram, saying unto thee, 
unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt and to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now here, God has said, I'm making a covenant with you. Abraham says, now how am I going to know that all this is going to happen? He says, now you take these animals. Now what? God has to have a substitute. He doesn't have a physical body. He doesn't become incarnate until Jesus comes. The second person of the Godhead becomes incarnate, takes on flesh. So he, he has a substitute in the animals for his side of the covenant. And he comes and walks in that blood. The smoking furnace and fire was the glory of God. God came down. Remember they would, see, they would look at, on, on, on Mount, um, oh gosh, went totally blank. Israel, Israel's mountains. Not Horeb, is it Horeb or? Huh? Horb? Horb? H-O-R-B-E-B? -E is that right? Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. The mountain, the mountain in Israel that God would come down on and smoke. It would look like smoke on the mountain. That was his presence. Well, see, Abram is in his sleep. He wakes up and he sees this going through the animals. God said, I'm making a covenant with you. Okay, what kind of co a blood covenant? God's going to cut a blood covenant with Abraham. Hallelujah. So what did Abraham do? He divided the animals. He drove away uh, the birds. Okay, God showed Abraham the future. He walked between the pieces and the blood of the animals. God made a promise. What's he going to give him? He's going to give him a son. He's going to give him land. That's, that's what he's promised him. Okay, look, if you will, into Genesis 17. Just a couple of chapters over. So what happens? Now remember they, they, when, when um, they would cut the covenant, they would, they would exchange things. They would also exchange names. So if I cut the covenant with uh, Dick, I'd become Ed Taylor Schubert. Now he, become, he would become Schubert Taylor. All right? We would exchange names. We exchange goods, that kind of thing. Well, God and Abraham exchanged names. Look at Genesis 17, 1. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God, or El Shaddai. That's another sermon. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I'll make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be Abram, but thou shalt be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So now Abram, or gets a new name. What? He's in covenant with God. He gets a new covenant name with God. He's no longer Abram. He's never referred to as Abram again. He's referred to as Abraham. Because he got a new name. Did you know God got a new name? At, from this point forward, God is not referred to as just God. He's referred to the God of Abraham. He got a new name. They exchanged names. Abram got Abraham, and God got the God of Abraham. And then, and then because he extended the covenant to, to his own, own down, he, he became the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is that's all because of covenant. This has nothing to do with just being cool. It was because there was a covenant cut, a covenant made. Abraham got, got blessings. Abraham got promises. He got a new name. God got a new name. Amen. Hallelujah. Sarah's name is changed to... Um, uh, Sarah, from Sarah to Sarah, meaning princess or mother of nations. God is called in Genesis 17, 7. And in, in uh, Genesis 24, 12, if we see it, he's the God of Abraham. Then the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, look in Genesis 17, look down in verse 10. And God says, this is the covenant which ye shall keep between me and you, then thy seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. See, man has to cut the blood, there has to be blood cut. I said blood has to be cut. You should circumcise the foreskin of your flesh, and it shall be a token. Now remember of, of the covenant between me and you. Remember, that, and they saw that they would put something, gunpowder or something into the wounds to make them a scar. Man had his mark in him that he was in covenant. The circumcision was a scar of proving there was a covenant relationship. Okay? Hallelujah. Glory to God. They shared a covenant meal. Remember, uh, God comes down. This, this is when Sarah laughs in Genesis 18. He comes down, and the three, 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 three men show up, 
And I uh, said, feed us. And Abraham goes and kills this calf and get, tells the wife to make bread and all this kind of stuff and goes and feeds him. That's the covenant meal. So now they've had, they've exchanged blessings, cursings, promises have been made. Hello? Names have been changed. Covenant meal has been shared. All these elements is what we see in blood covenant rites, especially in living, since, uh, Stanley living his travels through Africa. All those rituals and all those rites really came out of what God was doing. Hallelujah. Strong covenant. Gifts were exchanged. Abraham's told he's going to get the lamb. How? How much lamb? From Egypt to the Euphrates River. Not a 50-mile stretch. Hallelujah. It was not, it was not the Palestinians' homeland. That's just a, a political bunch of garbage. Hello? The Arab nations don't care about giving, uh, Israel and, and Palestinians living together. They want to kill Israel. They want to blow them up. They want to get rid of them. I have a good friend. Now, some, I don't know if he came to church, but he came to one of our Raymond meetings. American Fawaz, Thanik. Fawaz lives over in Winston. And we went to Ramah. Actually, we were roommates. At, he lived with us for a few months at, at, in our apartment at Ramah. And uh, our, 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 our fond nickname for Fawaz was the Jordanian Jew bomber. Because Fawaz was a kid. He grew up in Jordan. And then what he wanted to do when he grew up is he wanted to go join the Jordanian Air Force and go bomb the Jews. That's until he got saved. After he got saved, he didn't want to do that anymore. But because he lived in Jordan, he, he knew people. And, and talk with people who fought in the, the 1967 war. I think they, what they call it the Six-Day War or something. Okay? And they, they told him. And remember, they surprise attacked Israel and got their back in whooped. Not only did they get their back in whooped, because they came to wipe them out, Israel not only kicked their back in, try to be kind, they expanded their land. And they've been trying to get it back ever since through, through the U.N. What does U.N. stand for? Unnecessary nothingness. It's the biggest bunch of nothing that's ever been on the planet besides the um, League, of U League of States or League of whatever. League of Nations, thank you, Belinda. That preceded it. They should have just let that one die and left it alone. But he said this. He said they told him. He said we went to fight them and we came up across the dunes. He said they, said they told him there were millions of soldiers on the dunes. Israel didn't have millions of soldiers to put on the dunes. Angels came down. Why? Because there is a covenant between God, uh, the God of Abraham, and natural Israel also. And the more they try to wipe them out, the more they lose. There is no reason that little bitty nation should not be have wiped out. They're surrounded. I said, there, and we, yeah, well, we help them out. Yeah, and we help out the Palestinians and everybody else. Do we give them weapons and everything else? Because there's people who want Israel gone. All right? But there's a natural covenant. I'm talking about with the natural lineage of, Israel, of, of Abraham. God honors his word to Abraham in the natural and honors it to him in the spiritual. Amen? I said, there were millions of soldiers there. You don't surprise attack somebody and lose and lose land at the same time. Especially when you outnumber the other people. Unless angels come down out of heaven and kick your tush. Hello. So God promised him the land. He promised him a son. So he's going to give him Isaac. Now you remember there's a lot of things that happened in there. You know, remember, uh, 12 or 13 years after this, uh, uh, God, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah comes and says, Well, I'm not going to have a baby. You go on in there with, with, with Hagar. Men, Hagar is nothing but trouble. Because you're going to have Ishmael's. And Ishmael's will hurt you and detract you and get you off track. All right? So we're not going to go into all those this morning. So God gave him the land. God gave him a son. Made him fruitful among all the nations. Genesis uh, 17, 6. Uh, God said, I'll make the exceedingly fruitful and make nations to come out of you. And then God gave him his son Isaac. Let's look in Gen uh, I'm sorry. Um, and then Second Chronicles. Let's go to Second Chronicles, James two twenty three, and then we're going to come back to something else. So Second Chronicles, also known as Fourth Kings. 
See, I can be, I can be real whatever too. First, second Kings, and then Chronicles. First, second Chronicles were known as third and fourth Chronicles. I mean, uh, Kings at one time, and then they changed it to Chronicles. All right. So Genesis Chronicles, second Chronicles twenty verse seven. Listen to this: Art thou not God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave it to thy se the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? God is known as the friend of Abraham. I said, God is known as the friend of Abraham. Genesis two, tw J Genesis James, two twenty three. Woo! <laughs> two twenty three. Did I say James? Yeah. Two. That's one twenty three. That's why. I'm... As the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, God, Abraham believed God; it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. He's the God of Abraham. He's the, he became Abraham's friend. What did Jesus say about uh, his relationship, our relationship with him? He called you friends. Greater love, love hath nobody than this, and they lay down life for their friends. So it's a covenant term. I said it's a covenant term. It is a term used in relation to the fact that we're in covenant with God. Abraham was in covenant with God. He was his friend. He was a blood covenant partner of God. Strong. Strong. See, you can understand why I'm kind of getting to this because uh, when we finish this up next week, then we're going to get into the authority of the believer. The authority of the believer is based in this covenant. It's got a covenant basis to it. It's not just, well, I got saved, and I can save Jesus and get stuff done. No, there's a covenant basis to it. Our authority has not, and, this, and God is bound by His Word. He's bound by the blood of Jesus. He's bound by what He said. Not because we made Him, because He did it. Are you here? Glory to God. And so, Abraham is now the friend of God. God is His friend. God asks one thing. Beyond obedience and keeping and, and, and doing right. Look back, if you will, into Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 22. That's right after Genesis 21, by the way. E even in the original. Actually, if you go back originally, they don't have all these demarcations. Genesis 22, we're reading verses 1 through 12 at least. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now understand this. The word tempt in this usage does not mean to tempt as with evil. Okay? Are you here? You know, well, the Word of God tells us God tempts no man with evil. So it's not talking about a temptation in the sense to go do wrong. It, it tests to prove. Okay? So God tested or proved Abraham to see if he would do his part of the covenant. This is a covenant test. Do you understand? This is a covenant test. See, God's declared, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you a son, I'm going to make you fruitful, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to change your name, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm making my covenant with you. I left this part out. When God says for me, I'm going to make my covenant with you, that is referred to in theological terms as diatechy. It's an uneven covenant or an equal covenant. One party has everything, the other party has nothing. The only thing that Abraham had was God wanted to restore his creation. Now, I don't mean, I don't mean that in, in, in such demeaning terms as the only thing. <clears throat> but Abraham could offer nothing to God that would make God a better God. Put God in a better position. What he had to offer was himself in obedience to walk in fellowship with God. But he did not have land. He didn't have another heaven. Didn't have a throne bigger than God's. Couldn't, you know, pay off the note on the throne or the pearly gates or anything. Okay? So it's unequal. It's an unequal covenant, a diatechy covenant. And um, so God says here, um, Abraham, he, and Abraham says, Here am I. He said, Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I shall tell thee of. Well, wait a second, Lord. 
You come down here, you make a covenant with me. You promise me land, you promise me this, you promise me that. I talk to you about the fact I don't have a son. You say, I'll give you a son. Hello? And now you, and listen, and in the meantime, my wife tells me to go sleep with, with, with Hagar. And I do. And she gets pregnant, and I got Ishmael. And you came down a little bit later, and I asked you, oh, that he could live before you. You said, okay, but he's not the one. You gave me a promise. You said out of my loins and out of Sarah, my, the, my wife is going to come a son. And at 99 and 90 years old, they have a baby. Or 100, 190, because he turns 100. <clears throat> you did all that. And now you want me to go offer him as a burnt offering? Well, wait a second now. We're in covenant. God's made an oath. Abraham has to obey on his end of the covenant. But... He also knows God gave an oath that this is where the seed's coming from. Now, the New Testament tells us he received him raised from the dead in a figure. What's that? What's that? That's, that's, that's around the, about the block talk for. By faith, he believed that God was going to have to raise him up from the dead. If he took him up there and offered Isaac on that altar, he's going to have to stand there and watch God take the ashes and raise Isaac right back up out of there. Why? Because God said, out of that seed will, the, will all the nations be blessed. God told him that it was going to be Isaac that would carry on his posterity. Or posterity, I'm sorry. Posterity. Isaac was going to be the one. Made a big deal about it. Said it with Sarah, laughed about it, rebuked her. Why does your wife laugh? Sarah went in line. I didn't laugh. Oh, yeah, you did. I heard you. The Lord, that was the Lord said, I heard you. Lie to the Lord. Hey, he's smart. At least she didn't get uh, Zachariah's punishment. Couldn't talk until the, John the Baptist was born. Hello? And so, here it is. The covenant. God has made all these promises. God's done all this stuff. And all of a sudden, he comes to us and says, I want you to take the boy, and I want you to go up there, and you're going to sacrifice him on an altar. So what does Abraham do? He rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, and, and claved the wood for burnt offering, rose up and went to the place which God had told him. He, just, he obeyed. There are going to be times that God wants you to do something and just add absolute obedience that makes no sense to you you can't you can't see the other side you know how it has to turn out but you don't know how it's going to turn out and on the third day abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off and abraham said to his young men abide ye here with the ass and i and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you now he's going to start talking faith we're coming back. And what's the Lord told him to do? Go take that boy and offer him on sacrifice. Abraham's telling the guys that we'll be back. Kind of pull it down. I'll be back. Come, come. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father. He said, Here am I, my son. He said, now, can't you just look to King James? I mean, you know, if it had been today, it had been something like, hey, Dad, yo, what's up? All right? He said, behold, the fire, the wood. I just beginning to worry here, I guess. Where's the lamb? You just told him we're going to go worship. You brought wood for an offering. You got fire. You got a knife. And you got me. Where is the lamb? Uh, if Nathan was there, he'd be thinking. The boy likes to think. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. A little play on words there. And so they both went them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order. Can you, can you imagine, Isaac? Here it comes. There's the altar. There's the wood, and gets rope and starts wrapping it around him. Now you told me, Dad, you told me God's going to provide a lamb. What you wrapping me up for? Say bye. 
<laughs> Love you, son. But I gotta, I gotta obey God. And then he laid his son on the altar. And Abram stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And the ain't, well, this ain't looking good. He's laid on the altar, kind of like that Star Wars scene, you know, where they tell they tell uh, C three PO to you know do something, you know, tell him you're a god or something, you know, and uh, you're gonna use your powers if you don't stop this. Because they gonna, and Han Solo's there going, whoo, 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 <laughs> trying trying to blow the fire out. <laughs> it ain't looking good. And the angel of the Lord called out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou any harm, uh, uh, any thing to him. For now I know, listen, now I know thou fearest God, saying that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. Now stop. God had to know what Abraham was willing to give up to walk in covenant with him. And whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And God said, You're, you, I know you have not withheld your son from me. What's going to happen? And I'm not going to withhold my son from you. This is the seed of faith that Jesus could come and redeem us because of this act. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram. That ram wasn't there when they got there. Was caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Remember, you can have a substitute. And Abraham called the name of the place what? Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my Grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. <laughs> Let's do a little Jewish dance now. All right. Hey! That's what we used to do back in the old charismatic days. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What? Jehovah, the covenant name of God. Jireh, provision. The Lord is my provision. The Lord makes provision. Amen? So they have a covenant place. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. And he said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Praise God. That in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed, shall all nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. There's all through the Bible obedience. Samuel came to Saul when he did not do what he was told to do and he shows up and he says, Saul goes, I did everything I was told to do. And Samuel goes, what is that bleeding of the sheep in mine ear? He said, well, the people took the best animals and went to offer them as a sacrifice to God. He says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Here we have the obedience of Abraham. He could have tried to come up. He could have gone and gotten a different sacrifice. He could have gotten another animal and took it up there. But he, he said, well, I'll try this. See if the Lord will take it. God don't. This is important. God had a covenant with Abraham and had to know what Abraham would do in response to that covenant. And when he offered up Isaac, and like I said, the New Testament says he did it by faith. He believed God was going to raise him from the dead. And so in his heart, he had slain his son. He had burnt him to the crisp, and God raised him up out of those ashes and put him, gave him his son back. And then God stops. That's all I needed. I needed the act of obedience and the faith of obedience. It takes faith to obey. I said, it takes faith to obey. And God said, that's, enough. that's good enough. That's good enough. Your heart did it. And because your heart was to fulfill your side of the covenant. Now, I'm going to multiply you. And then he says this, and in thy seed. Now, we know from Galatians, the reference to the seed is more than just Isaac and Jacob. It is spe specifically talking about 
And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And back in earlier in Galatians it says, And he said not and to seeds as of many, but seed as of one, which is Christ. Jesus is the seed. And all nations are blessed through Jesus. And Abraham's act of faith and obedience and offering Isaac, which God did not ultimately require, he stopped him, but because his faith was there and his heart was there and his obedience was there, God said, that's good enough for me. And now I'm going to send my son. And my son's going to bless all the nations of the world. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because Jesus came. Abraham, because you did this, I now have an avenue into the earth to send my son to redeem humanity and all nations to be blessed because of him. Hallelujah. How strong is covenant? How strong is the covenant? And today, what? If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed? We're part of the body of Christ. The seed is in reference to Jesus. And heirs according to the promise. The promises of Abraham. The promise. Because you know, I, I, I really get aggravated with people who don't just use Holy Ghost information. All those promises are to the Jews. Woo! He's not a Jew outwardly, but a Jew inwardly. Whose circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart. I'm a spiritual Jew. The Bible calls us the Israel of God. We're spiritual Israel. Or Israel. Okay? I can sound real theological too. Israel. All right? We are walking in a harmony and a covenant with God through Jesus Christ because Abraham. God made a covenant with a man. And that man obeyed the covenant. And when God made a demand for he, what he wanted out of the covenant, now what was, God wasn't interested in killing Isaac. That's why he didn't let him kill him. He could have raised him up from the dead. That wasn't his plan. Why? Because of the fall of man, because Satan became the God of this world, God needed an avenue into the earth, and he had to do it through covenant. He had to do it through a man who had a legal right to be there. And because of that, he found him a man. But he had to know how obedient he was and had to have the seed to work with of faith so that he could do his, what he was ultimately wanting to do is bring Jesus in, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And because Abraham obeyed, the seed of faith was planted. God is now in covenant with a man whom will give everything for him, and now God's going to give everything for man. He sent Jesus. And we now we have a new, we have a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. Hallelujah. The whole plan, starting with the time God showed him and started talking to Abraham to begin with was to get to that mountain and have Abraham offer Isaac so God could offer up Jesus for the sins of the world. That was the whole end game to start with. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The very first time he showed up and said, Get thee out of thy kindred from thy father's house and away from thy family and go into a land that I show thee, God's whole plan was to get Abraham to that mountain with his son. And have an act of faith that would sow the seed to bring Jesus. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, praise God. Because we need, and listen, that covenant was cut. That covenant was fulfilled. And it's indissolvable and it cannot be annulled. That's why people go, well, God may or may not do what he said he would do. No, 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 he's in covenant. I said he's in covenant. Glory to God, he's in covenant. He's made a covenant. And he is our Jehovah Jireh. 
our provision. Now, if you go study Schofield's Bible, he says the name Jehovah. Now, we've talked about this before, the, the four letters, Y-H-W-H. The Germans translated, uh, transliterated and added vowels and made it Jehovah. Uh, people came along in the last 100 years or 50, 75 years and wanted to be more Jewish, and so they took an added vowels and got Yahweh. It comes from the same four-letter word that they can't pronounce. Y-H-W-H. Okay? But the Germans, because they use a V for an, a W and a J for a, y, for a Y, put the J-V, H-V, put the vowels in and got Jehovah. Yahweh is the Y and some vowels, so Yahweh. They left the Y and the a W in there. That's how, they, that's how those words came out in English. Okay? But they're, they are both from the, the, the word you'll see in the Old Testament. The, the little caps, Lord, when, and little caps are all little caps. That's the Y-H-W-H. That's where it's used, okay? And Schofield says it is the distinctive covenant name of God from the covenant-keeping God who cannot break covenant. And all the hyphenated names after that are an ongoing self-revelation of the covenant God. Jehovah uh, Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord or the covenant God who makes provision for thee. Jehovah Shalom, the covenant God who gives you peace. Jehovah Unkadesh, the God our righteous, the covenant God of our righteousness. Amen? Jehovah Shama, you know, Jehovah Nisi, the, the covenant God who is our banner or captain of victory. God is a covenant keeping God. And let me tell you something. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. And God is not a man that he should lie. God does not break covenant. God is the God who keeps covenant. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving.